Welcome to Central United Methodist Church on this blessed Sunday morning. May God richly bless you. Working with our volunteers and faithful partners, we are now providing more meals each day and more days each week. Due to the current government restrictions, our meals are currently available on a takeout only basis and are provided without cost to anyone who comes to our door. If you would uh, like a hot, nutritious meal, Central United Methodist Church is serving Monday through Friday, plus the first two Saturdays of each month. Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday is a dinner meal from 4 to 5 p.m. Lunch on Tuesdays from 11.30 to 1, and the first two Saturdays of each month is a breakfast from 9 to 10.30. We thank all of our dedicated volunteers and partners for their tireless efforts and pray God's rich blessings on everyone coming to Central to receive a meal.
When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then, through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Sharing of our joys and concerns. We continue to lift up all those in our community, our country, and the world who are being impacted by the coronavirus. We pray for God's support and protection of all the doctors, nurses, policemen, firemen, and other emergency workers who must work in the midst of this deadly virus. Join me in our opening prayer. Lord God, you who created us and redeemed us and sustained us, we rejoice that you have chosen us to be your own and that you visit us and dwell with us and open to, our, to us the ways to abundant life. We are full of awe and wonder at what you have done and what you continue to do. By your word, the heavens and the earth were made. By the bounty of your mercy in Jesus Christ, we have been born to new life. Your spirit fills the whole world with your loving kindness and gives us the power we need to be your witness and to lift up your holy name. Blessed are you, O God, and blessed are all who live in you. Help us today to joyfully proclaim our faith and to worship you as you desire. Bring us closer to you and to one another and in our prayers and our thanksgiving, our hearing and our speaking and our giving and receiving. Make us more completely thine. We ask it in the name of Jesus who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forevermore. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is, he, is from Hebrews 9, verses 11 through 14. Hear the word of the Lord, that when Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sparkling of ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, to God, purify our conscience from death, works to worship the living God, the reading of God's word for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our message title this morning, I thought it was appropriate for Halloween, is death by chalk. So bow with me, gracious and loving God. We are called, we are called here to be with you this day. We ask, Lord, that these words, that these words be your words and not mine, and that we would be able to develop a closer relationship with you as we walk the journey to eternity. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. Death by chocolate. Just the words make your mouth water. Death by chocolate cake. Death by chocolate brownies. 
death by chocolate mousse, and death by chocolate truffle. Almost every upscale, elegant restaurant seems to offer their own version of this extra rich, extra decadent, extra artery clogging delight they dub death by chocolate. For committed chocoholics like myself, this dessert offers the ultimate attempt to sweeten the bitterest reality life offers all of us, the plain and simple fact that everyone is going to die. No exceptions. Everybody in this room will one day walk through the valley of the shadow of death. No one gets a free pass through this valley. Everyone in this room is going to die. There are two ways this is going to happen. Two ways life can end, either through age or accident. It doesn't matter if you spend two hours a day sweating at the local gym. It doesn't matter if you take every vitamin found in a drugstore. It doesn't matter if you never let a cholesterol-laden tidbit cross your lips. It doesn't matter if you obey every safety regulation ever written for any product. It doesn't matter if you drastically reduce the stress factor from all that you do. One day, you and I will die. Whether we will suffer death by chocolate or death by violence, accident, illness, or simply a wearing out from old age, death will ultimately find each and every one of us. It is the one sure event in our lives the one experience without question which we will all have in common. Rich or poor, black or white, sophisticated or simple, educated or illiterate, we all will die. The great common denominator hasn't made contemplating our end any easier or ideas about death the least bit homogeneous. Pop culture is currently making death sexy. Look at CSI, CSI Miami, Navy, NCIS, etc., etc. We are almost obsessed, obsessed with the moment of death as television recreates the death moments that a bullet makes as it makes its way through a body or an anatomical exploration of a knife that punctures a heart. But in terms of what happens after death, there is a kind of acceptable pandemonium regarding the subject, says John Killinger in the book God, the Devil, and Harry Potter. Although probably most of us would concur with the observation made by John Denmark of Florida, who remarks, when I die, I want to go like Grandpa, peacefully and in his sleep, not yelling and screaming like the passengers in his car. <laughs> Think about our own death had confronted the, great, the greatest minds. As he lay dying, the great Leo Toystel said, I don't understand what I'm supposed to do. Helping people know what to do when they die has generated a huge literature in the last half of the 20th century. In the giant stack of advice and insights generated by the genre of death literature, scholars warn that denying the reality of death is a stage that many of us get stuck in. It is as though if we refuse to acknowledge death, it will lose its ability to catch us up in its grip. There is an old story about three friends one afternoon who were vaguely contemplating the inevitability of their own death. They pose the following questions to themselves. When you're at your cascade and friends and family or mourning upon you, what would you like to hear them say about you? The first guy said, 
I would like to hear them say that I was a great doctor of my time and a great family man. The second guy said, I'd like to hear that I was a wonderful husband and school teacher who made a huge difference in, my, in the children of tomorrow. The last guy replied, I'd like to hear them say, look, he's moving. <laughs> There's an old tale about a woman of great wealth whose child died and she went to a wise man in the village who was known to perform miracles. The woman offered to give away all of her wealth if the child could only be brought back to life. The wise man told her that in order for her wish to be granted, she would have to journey through the land and bring him a coal from the fire of just one house that death had not touched, a house in which no one, not master or servant, and grieved for the loss of a loved one. The woman ran from house to house and at the end of the year returned to the wise man without the coal, but with a heart that had finally accepted the obvious fact that death is a part of life and no one is exempt from the sorrow that moves in its wake. The Hebrew author in today's epistle lesson accepts that reality of death not only for each of us, but for Jesus Christ as well. He acknowledges simple and succinctly that it is appointed for mortals to die, mortals to die once and after the judgment, because God chose to incarnate the deity in humanity. Even Jesus had to experience it death with, along with all men and women but willingly participate in the great commonality in the death that awaits all human beings. Jesus experienced the totality of human frailty and fallenness. What an astounding thought. Each of us will ultimately have death in common with Jesus Christ. But if it is the specter of loss and completeness and depletion that makes human death appear so bitter and wasteful. The book of Hebrews reminds us today that with Christ's own death, our perception on death must be radically changed. Ever notice how when a person of considerable accomplishment dies, the person doing the eulogy is likely to mention how much the world has been impoverished by the person's death. A bright light has gone out in the world. The world will be, the world will surely miss her or his many talents. Humanity has suffered a great loss. We cannot speak this way about Jesus' death. In truth, the world was not impoverished, but Jesus' death, but was enriched. In truth, it was not until the final moment on Calvary when Jesus confidently let go, saying, it is accomplished, that, that the world took possession of its greatest treasure and our greatest hope. Jesus' death and resurrection forever altered the meaning of death. His sacrifice made eternal redemption complete forgiveness and utter purification available through the power of God's grace. Jesus transformed human death from an ending into a beginning, from failure and defeat into a triumphant new life, an eternal existence in Christ. As the Apostle Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, these troubles and sufferings of ours are after all quite small and won't last very long. Yet the short time of distress will result in God's richest blessing upon us forever and ever. So we do not look at what we see right now, the troubles all around us, but we look forward to the joys in heaven, which we have not yet seen. The troubles 
will soon be over, but the joy to come will last forever. As it tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, 17 and 18, instead of nervously or pigheadedly denying the inevitability of death, a Christian looked towards death as a fulfillment of all human possibility, as an introduction to the divine reality. It's at the end of this earthly life that the opportunity for our most genuine life may be experienced. In the words of the poet Patrick Kavanaugh, only those who have flown home to God have flown at all. If we have confidence in Christ and this once and for all nature of Jesus' death and life and death in this world becomes a synthetic, not an aesthetic, our lives become an extension of Christ's death. For Christians, our living takes its power and persistence in commitment and compassion for our death to come. Christ's sacrifice gave both life to life and life to our death. One of my favorite stories that I have used at memorial service is this one from Norman Vincent Peale. It's a graphic story of a conversation between a mother and her unborn child in the eighth month of pregnancy. The mother cradled, cradled the child with her hands. If she could only carry on a conversation, it would go something like this. My little one, soon you are to be born. Another month or so and you will come out of the womb into life. Your father, your brothers, and your sisters, and I can barely wait for that moment when you are born. The little one, if he could, would probably argue back, I don't want to be born. I like it here. All my needs are met. It's dark, warm, moist, and comfortable here. Don't talk to me about birth. The mother would respond, but my little one, it's beautiful out here. There's sunshine, flowers, laughter, dancing, friendship, and music. So it's so much better. In fact, it's terrible if you stay in there too long. And the little one would argue back, I don't know anything about any of those things. All I know is that in here, all my needs are met. I rather have what I know than what I don't know. The mother would never convince the little one that to stay in there too long would actually be ghastly. Then Dr. Pio would pause and say, it's now 70, 80, 90 years. The little unborn child is now a grown man. The conversation continues this time not with his mother, but with his father, his heavenly father, who tells him, my son, I love you. I've made provisions for you beyond this life. I've come in the person of Jesus Christ to die for your sins. I know life is awesome, but it's only a passage into my presence. I tried to describe to you in the Bible the life that is better than any life you have experienced on earth. It's a quality life. Although I've used my best descriptions, analogies, and metaphors to somehow help you anticipate it, it goes beyond anything you've experienced. Trust me. The old argument goes on the same way it did decades before when he was in the womb. I don't understand what you're talking about. I like it here. I don't want to die. I have a hard time believing that it would be any better. Once again, he's having a hard time trusting someone who really knows better than he does. Holding on to things, to your safety, to yourself, to your presence, to your identity, to your resources, to your security. These are all non-Jesus. The way of maximum security 
is the way of Satan. The way of self-expenditures are the way of Jesus. Are you, am I, like the child in the womb? Are we prepared to claim God's promise? Will you trust God? Acts 13, 36 summarized King David this way. For when David had served God's purposes in his own generation, he fell asleep. In the words of my favorite benediction, may you live until the words of your life is fully spoken. Would you repeat after me? May I live until the words of my life is fully spoken. May I live until the words of my life is fully spoken. Now, when I challenge, now what? I challenge you to figure that one out. Praise be to God. Amen. Now is the time where we will receive our tithes and offerings of love. Reminder that church expenses like utilities and salaries continue each week, even when we can't meet together for worship. There are three ways to give. You can mail your checks with your offering envelope. You can drop your offering envelope through the mail slot in the 13th Street ramp door, or you can contribute by clicking on the donate button on our website, www.centralunitedmethodistchurch.org. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we now go forth into the world to fulfill our calling as the people of God, the body of Christ. Prepare with me for the benediction. May God's created spirit be with us in our hearts and minds as we leave this place. May God's created spirit help us to see with new wonder the splendor of your creation all around us and inspire us to preserve and protect it. Go now in peace, love, and care for one another in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.